Hello and welcome back to part two of my first look at the new game Nemesis. In this part I'm looking at the rule book. Now the rule book is, as you see, a rather small size, like paperback. It's about 190 pages, of which I estimate about 80 pages of rules. Another 95 are army lists, and the rest is fluff, you know, fiction, illustrations, and so forth. It's in English, it's been translated from Spanish. Uh, the translation is so-so. Uh, I mean, when, when in the fiction, the, um, the prose is really not that readable. The rules text is mostly okay. I mean, I think it's easier to translate propositional statements than it is a text which tries to convey some sort of emotions or, or uh, moods. And the rules are mostly clear. And in the cases where it's not clear, it's, it's not the language that makes it unclear. It's simply a, a lack of stating uh, things. What sort of game is this? It's a skirmish game, medium-sized skirmish game. It um, it doesn't have the huge armies of something like Warhammer, Kings of War, or historical war games, it, but it's not just the half dozen models of something like Malifaux. Uh, the average game is said to be about four. Is said to be four hundred points, and for four hundred points, you will get an average about maybe twenty models per side, depending on you know you can go for. Uh, tougher models and then get fewer ones or you can get a lot of rabble and you'll get more but that is about the size of it and the rules to to, to summarize to begin with they're they're fairly clear they they I, I understand what they're trying to do and I agree with most of them I think mostly they're good rules uh, they make sense uh, I have no real criticisms. I have some questions about a few details, but that's about it. Um, if we start here at the beginning, first thing I like is they use the metric system. It's, just, it's centimeters instead of inches. Uh, they use D10 rolls. Um, unfortunately, they, they use two kinds of rolls. They have what they call tests and what they call rolls. And in tests, you roll equal to or under your stat, and, and a roll is instead adding your stat to the roll and comparing it to an opponent's roll, and the high roll wins. So sometimes you want to roll low and sometimes high, which is not um, ideal, but you can get around it. They have this funny <laughs> translation of an automatic miss is called a fluff. <laughs> which goes against what we normally call fluff in gaming today, which is, you know, the fiction uh, of, of the background and so forth. But I, I do remember that back in the day, we used to call, say, that you fluffed a roll when you missed. Um, today, I would rather say whiff, but oh well. Um, anyway, a, a fluff is a, a natural one. Uh, and they have something called feats, which are exploding dies. When you roll a natural 10, you get to roll again and add them together. And if it's another 10, you roll again and so forth and so forth. Um, the miniatures are described. I, I, I mentioned this when I talked about the stat cards. You can see here that the, um, the names of the things, uh, the stats, don't seem to match up to the abbreviations. That's because the abbreviations are probably of the original Spanish words but you can make up your own meanings. For example, aim, which is your ranged combat skill, is PU. Well, that's because you pew pew. Ha <laughs> ha. And strength is FU, because you say that to your opponents. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, anyway, they have a few too many stats for my taste. They have as many as in Warhammer, which is a few too many. Fortunately, they're used in a more intelligent way. At least we have no stupid charts where you have to cross-reference stats to get a target number. It's, it's always clean opposed rolls or just tests under the target number. And um, 
one thing I don't understand here is they have something called survival factor, which is your health or wounds or hit points. Uh, and most most uh, non-hero figures only have one, but in the army lists, this is somewhat inconsistently listed. As in, I don't know if you can see here, but for example, the troops here, most of them have a dash under the FS factor, but few of them have a 1. I don't get it. What's the functional difference between 1 and... I mean, the dash doesn't mean they have none, it just means they get killed in one hit, but a 1 means the same thing. So why wouldn't it just say 1 for all of them? Uh, I haven't found nothing in the rulebook to explain this. But that's a minor thing. Um, It starts off with a lot of standard stuff. It divides up miniatures into uh, heroes, normal troops, marksmen, creatures of war machines. It talks about uh, line of sight, zones of control, how to set up the battle, how to choose your armies with limits on how large a percentage of your points can be the various types of units. You know, you can only have 50% heroes, 25% range troops, or 30% uh, big things like creatures or war machines. How to set up the terrain and deploy. This is all similar to many other games. Uh, the turn and the round. The round they, they, they play in rounds with alternating activation. You roll initiative at the beginning of each round and the winner gets to choose who activates first and then you uh, activate one unit and then the other person activates the unit and so forth. I haven't found any abilities that monkey with the activation order. The way, for example, in, in Malfo, where you have a lot of uh, abilities that allow allies to activate directly after us another unit. Uh, but on the other hand, the basic rules do have um, a bunch of cases where you um, sort of interrupt the normal order of activation when, to react to things other units are doing. But we'll get to that. Uh, first we have chapters that are again fairly standard, the movement and terrain, nothing, nothing unusual there. And then we get to the core mechanic, which is orders. Um, see, your heroes have command points and they need to spend command points. An, an average um, commander, if you look at, for example, the most normal human faction here, the Kingdom of God, uh, you can see here that the, okay, this column here, man, is for some reason command points. Okay, now the queen of the whole kingdom has four. That's more, the max. But if you look at normal heroes, they have one or two. For example, the sergeant here, which seems like the cheap option to get a lot of command points out there he has two. What this means is he can give an order to two units per round. And units need an order to do anything other than just move or um, continue fighting if they're already in close combat. If, if they're already locked in close combat, they don't need an order to keep fighting. They can do that on their own. But anything else, they need a command point. Or, or if all your command points are spent or there's no leader or hero in range they can try to make a uh, a courage test uh, in order to to do something on their own initiative but mostly they need orders and as i say this is probably this is intended to be the core mechanic of the game obviously this is your your um um command points are the currency that your tactics are going to revolve around, which I think is an interesting mechanic. Now, here we have orders interrupting activation, and it's in these areas that a few things are a little unclear, but I think that you should make a very, as conservative and interpretation as possible. I mean, the question is whether certain things actually need 
command points. Or How appropriate that the time limit on my camera interrupted me as I was talking about interrupting activations. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, my question is whether these reactive activations count as your activation for the round and if they require command points. Um, and I think they should unless explicitly stated otherwise. Uh, because, again, that's probably the intent of the rules, as I understand them. But, let's move on. Um, there are a bunch of orders. There are either orders to move in different ways, or to shoot, or to attack in close combat. Now, each faction, except one, has a unique order that only they can do. The the faction that is left without one is the Exiles, who I believe were the last added to the game. That might be why they don't have an order of their own. Um, the others are not made equal. For example, the Rockavivas have one that sucks, whereas the Orphans and the Thousand Faces have special orders that they will be using all the time. As I have not played the game yet, I, I don't know if this is balanced against the other uh, traits of the factions. I hope so. Uh, I hope like the Rock videos are better in some other ways. Compensate for the fact that their unique order is not very useful. But anyway, um, orders, as you can tell, are, are to do things like well, just about everything you might want to do outside of, of uh, just moving. And to be uh, clear here, normal movement cannot move you into combat. The only way to get into close combat or melee is to charge, and charging needs an order. And there's a lot of rules for how to, how to respond to a charge. Uh, they have sometimes strange names. The counter charge, for example, uh, sounds like uh, okay, like like you would start running yourself and meet the opponent halfway. But no, that's not what's happening. The the charging unit is the only one that moves. The counter charge simply means you have the ability to to hit them back. If you do anything else, like withstand a charge or close ranks, you're purely defensive and you can only try to sort of mitigate damage. And it's... I found it perhaps a little bit odd that retreating is almost always successful, because if you say that you're going to retreat, you, you move your movement plus a d10 centimeters, and a charge is only the normal movement range for the attacking unit, so unless the retreating unit is much, much slower in its base move, uh, you're not going to catch them. But I suppose that's uh, compensated by the tactical loss of, of, you know, if you retreat, you're giving up position, you're giving up ground. Um, as for the resolutions of combat, It's resolved on a model-by-model basis, so you don't roll a fistful of dice for the whole unit. You have to know for each die roll exactly which unit is, which model is, which is attacking which other model. But because the model count is so low, this is not a problem. I, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be a problem. It seems reasonable to make this many rolls. Um, you have to make a two rolls whenever you're attacking somebody. First to hit and then to damage. And in shooting this is the difficulty is set by the weapon and uh, the strength of the weapon against the toughness blah blah blah. Uh, in, in close combat you do opposed rolls which means each side in the conflict makes a roll and high roll wins and gets to damage the opponent. As long as and here's the thing where orders come in. If, um, rather, activations, you, you don't get to fight an infinite number of times in a round. 
you can only activate the fight of combat once. And this means that outflanking and, and uh, outnumbering the opponent is very effective because once the unit has activated for combat against one opponent, if another opponent strikes it, it it's kind of defenseless. So this is probably a core tactic, I will assume. And well, we don't need to go through all of that. The, and after combat results, you see which unit lost the most, uh, took the most damage, and they have to make a courage test or flee. Morale is also a big thing in the game. We have some simple magic rules. They don't seem overpowered. They're mostly buffs or debuffs. They're not. They're not. Are they, there aren't very many direct damage spells. Uh, we have some rules for, like, oh, well, morale, courage, fear, war machines. They seem reasonable. Uh, they're not that complicated. Um, the juggers, which are these huge constructs or large monsters, they're a bit... Um, they don't outright state this, but... Um, I assume the pilots of them are not on the board to begin with. They're considered to be inside the jugger, because it just says here if, the, if a jugger is killed, then the pilot figure is put on the board within five centimeters of it, and killing the jugger only gives the opponent uh, half the point value in in victory points when you. So, so I, again, it's not stated, but I assume you get the other half if you kill the pilot as well. Um, seems reasonable. And we have the special rules for whatever um, special abilities they have. We have a list of spells. We have scenarios. There are only seven scenarios, and they're all pretty basic, very simplistic. But I guess experienced gamers can make up their own. And then the rest of the book is the the army lists. And there is some fluff, which is kind of interesting. It, it's sort of in media res. It, it sort of starts in the middle. It doesn't actually explain everything. For example, there seems to be a magical resource in this world called Galgus, which are never ex actually explained in the entire rulebook what the heck that is. I haven't... Uh, they might talk about this on their website, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look into it if I ever play the game. Um, the fluff for the factions is sometimes kind of unusual, and it's very imaginative. None of the factions are uh, bog-standard. Well, the most standards would be the Kingdom of God, which are just mostly normal humans. Uh, then we have the the orphans, which are really weird. They they're they're like unaging children uh, who are you know immortal. Uh, the thousand faces cult, which are you know weird barbarians. Some of them have, some of you whom have mutated into beastmen. We have the not alive, which are undead, but they are. They're not your usual undead. The, the the background story behind them is uh, kind of unusual and, and unique. The Rock of Vivas, which are, again, sort of uh, human-like. I suppose they're kind of dwarves, but, but matriarchal dwarves. And the Exiled, which are... Well, I don't know exactly how to describe them, but they are—they're they're, um, uh, the mechanomancers, sort of a steampunk guys of this. So, before I run into the time limit again, uh, that's my overview of the game. I kind of—I have a, my first impression of it is positive. I like what I see, and um, and if I ever get the chance, I'll be happy to play this game. I, I suppose that would require me to, to paint up both of the factions I have and convince a friend to play it against me. But you never know what might happen. For the time being, this is going in, into uh, 
back into its box and because I have other uh, painting projects prioritized. Well, thank you for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, the information or found it useful in some way. But until next video, this is Doc Yan signing off.